Part of the wonder and the mystery of Christmas Eve is to hear once again the Christmas story as told by Luke. I would invite you, in honor of the reading of the Gospel, to stand. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled on the tax lists. This first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. Everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. He went there to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage, and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the guest house. Nearby, Shepherds were in the fields, guarding their sheep at night, at night. The Lord's angels stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. The angel said, Don't be afraid, for I bring you news, wonderful and joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. And they said together, Glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among all God's people. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go now. Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. And they went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw this, they reported what had been told about this child. And everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds said. Mary committed all these things to memory and considered them carefully in her heart. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Everything happened just as they had been told. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh God, in the gentleness and the care of your spirit on this holy night, we ask that you come to us so that our ears may be opened and we may hear the word that you have for us. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Do you realize that nearly every Christmas decoration that we enjoy year after year is from Luke? The manger scenes with Mary and Joseph and the baby, they're from Luke. The shepherds in the fields tending their flock by night, that's from Luke. All of the angels that we see at Christmas time, they're all from Luke. In fact, Luke was the only gospel writer to tell of the visit of an angel to Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary. It was Luke who told the story of an angel visiting the shepherds, announcing the birth of the Christ child. And in each of those appearances, the angel began with a timeless message. Don't be afraid, because I am bringing you good news. 
Now think of this. After all of his research, Luke was convinced that the stories he had heard were compelling enough to include them in his gospel. And as a result, I would venture to say that many of us who are sitting here in this sanctuary tonight have learned to entertain the possibility of the miraculous, all because of the way Luke told his story. There's probably not a story in all of literature that introduces the idea of a spiritual realm that is beyond human understanding or human explanation. And so the point, the point of rehearsing the Christmas story year after year is that the experiences that happened to the people centuries ago just might, just might happen to us. If we can wrap our minds around the possibility that the miraculous really occurred once upon a time, then perhaps the miraculous can happen to us. So allow me, will you, to bring the nativity story to the here and now. Have you ever encountered an angel? Have you received a miraculous kind of message from an unexpected source that provided just what you needed at just the right time? Over the years, artists have been fascinated with depicting stories of the scriptures. Artists have created images of angels that are elaborate with flowing gowns and halos and wings. Most paintings and statues depict angels as being female, although we know what angels really are. The compilation of all those artistic, literary, or cinematographic images have worked together to create in our minds an angel that is like an ethereal being in cloud-like form. But from a biblical standpoint, the word angel simply means messenger. An angel is a messenger from God. The writer of Hebrews was bold enough to suggest that some of us have entertained angels without even being aware How's that for an image to consider? Years ago, I was a young and inexperienced pastor that was in over my head. I was one of four pastors on a large staff. We had a growing congregation in St. Petersburg, Florida. The challenges of ministry in that place and in that time and season, coupled with my own inexperience, created a discomfort within me that was more upsetting than probably at any time or place in 35 years of ministry. The way I finally dealt with that situation was to resign. I was confused. I was lost. I had simply had enough turmoil, and I walked away, even though, even though I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. I found a job in a music store in the Clearwater Mall as a piano salesman. I knew something about pianos. And I had a little experience in sales because my father was a piano technician who owned a piano store in Flint, where I grew up. I worked for my father on weekends and during summer breaks from college. 
so the new job seemed at least a good temporary fit. It was a few days after Christmas. I opened the store that morning and was beginning to take down the decorations. As was normative, the mall was full of folks who were walking for exercise. I noticed a man who seemed to cycle back in front of the store rather quickly. It was as though he was hovering in front of the store, just walking two or three stores and then coming back around. He finally came into the store and greeted me. We exchanged pleasantries, and then he said, I feel like I'm supposed to give you a message. I said, really? What kind of message? He said, I feel like I'm supposed to tell you that everything's going to be okay. I don't know what that means to you, but you need to be patient and keep your faith. You need to trust that internal voice. And when the doors begin to open for you, trust them and walk through them. I was stunned. I wanted more information. I began to engage him, and I began to question him. What did he mean? And he explained, I don't have any more information. I was walking, just as I do every single morning, but today I felt drawn to the store and to you, and I felt compelled to tell you what I've already told you. That's all I know. And if it fits for you, so be it. And he left, and I never saw him again. I went to my desk, and I wrote down what the man said as close to verbatim as I could remember. The more I wrote, the more puzzled I became. I thought, what on earth just happened? For weeks, I thought about that message. I didn't know his name. I didn't know where he came from. I didn't know his story. I didn't know if he was a person of faith. I didn't know if he was a quack just out walking around giving anybody a message in the mall who would listen to him. All I had to deal with was an unusual message that resonated with my situation. Over the next few weeks, I applied to graduate school, and I was accepted. I got a letter a few days later that I had been given a full scholarship. Two weeks later, I received a phone call from a district superintendent near the university who offered me a pastoral appointment while I was in school. Now understand, from the time I met that man to September, I began a new career as a student. I was serving as a pastor of two small congregations. I was living in a parsonage with no living expenses, plus an income and benefits, and ultimately a new direction in my life. Was that man an angel? I don't know. For 40 years now, I've wondered. I wonder if the shepherds out on the Judean hillside felt anything at all, like I did. They had heard a message, and they needed to test that message, just as I did. You remember the phrasing in the story? Let's go to Bethlehem and see what's happened there. 
Let's confirm. Hear that? Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. Listen to the message that the angels gave in light of our world, will you? In a climate of fear, the angel said, don't be afraid. In a climate of bad news, bad news that we hear regularly. The angel declared that love and joy and hope is the basis of good news. And in the timeless search for peace and goodwill, the angel announced that God's peace will come in Christ. You see, friends, looking back, the message that I received from the man in the mall was confirmed by what unfolded after our brief conversation. The message that the shepherds received was confirmed when Jesus grew in influence as the Holy One of God who fulfilled all the promises of God. So that tells me something, friends. It tells me something. Here it is. I believe that God continues to deliver messages in unexpected ways. I wonder if we're listening. God has and is revealing a message to us. Fear not, the angel. For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy for all people. For unto you is born a Savior named Jesus. I wonder, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with that kind? Thank you for being with us on this Christmas Eve. We trust that God has spoken to you in whatever way you have needed for your spiritual journey. I invite you to please take your candles. We have one more service. If you would put your candle in the, ba uh, the plastic tubs as you leave the sanctuary, that would be helpful. Will you pray with me? Go with us now, gracious God, into this holy night. Surround us with your love and your peace, your joy and hope.